This has been a three-part series of when God doesn't make sense. And I mean, I think we all, through our life somewhere, can relate to the fact that we didn't feel like God made sense to us. Amen? We prayed for something, we didn't get it. Or, or we believed for something, we didn't get it. We stood on God's Word and didn't get it. Come on, y'all. And we see babies die, and we see all the tragedy and stuff that we see in the world today. And sometimes, where are you at, God? Where's that loving God at that we speak of in the Bible? Where's that, where's that God of peace when peace doesn't seem to come? And where's that God that, when, that, that talks about joy when joy just can't be found? Y'all with me today? The first week we talked about when John the Baptist was put in jail and... You know it didn't make sense to John the Baptist when, when here he is, the cousin of Jesus, prepared a way for him, and Jesus didn't come and break the prison bars down and get him out of jail. Instead, he was allowed to be beheaded and, and his head given to the uh, king. Then last week we talked about sometimes we feel like God is, is late. When we talked about Lazarus, we talked about a 907 God and a 908 because on page 907, he was dead. On page 908 of my Bible, he was alive. See, God's never late. He's always on time. Our problem is, is we get our timing and his timing confused. And everybody said, I mean, our flesh is crying out for something, but God's saying no. Sometimes he's just doing something in you before he can do it through you. And somebody needs to receive that today. But today we're going to talk about when God doesn't seem, when he seems uncooperative with us. Amen? I want to talk about two things that, from my personal experience. Uh, I remember when I first got saved, I had an old El Camino that I built from the ground up, you know. Um, I've always made sure my wife had something real nice to drive, and I always drove the junk. Something that was paid for, you know, the liability car. You know, the one you put just liability on. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> if you lose it, you lose it. Oh, well. And, and, and I remember, I mean, that, that car stretched my faith so much, it wasn't even funny. I, I mean, you had to have faith that if it was going to start or not. And I'll never forget one day I got in there and, and I turned the key and just rump, rump, rump. Oh, my gosh. I need to go. I don't have time to find something to come jump this thing off and get it going. I got to go. Well, I'd, I'd heard that you lay hands on stuff, pray and believe, anoint it with oil. Everything's good. As foolish as I felt, I knew I needed to get myself to work. See, I'm one of those people when I'm 15, 15 minutes before, I'm already late. Okay. Now, there's some people when they're 15 minutes late, they're just on time, but not me. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway. The, so I do this. I lay hands on this car and miraculously, boom, fire right up. Boy, I rejoice. I'm telling everybody about it. No matter, no matter how silly it may sound. I knew God was showed me his power that day. Y'all with me today? I, I, I showed me that day that he's powerful enough to crank my car. And that he's concerned enough about my well-being to start that car. Man, I got to where I would lay hands on everything. And I mean, every, my dog. 
Everybody knew it was my dog because he had oil dripping off the top of his head. I laid hands on everything I had because that's, I believed in the power of prayer. Somebody say, I believe in the power of prayer. I still today believe in the power of prayer. The power of prayer changes things. I know sometimes when we're praying, we don't think that it's working. But can I tell you something? He heard you the first time. Matter of fact, the Word of God says that he already knows your needs before you come to him. But man, I prayed over that car and boom. It started up. And a few other things. Got several preacher stories I could tell you on that. But then there come a day. I laid hands on my wife and prayed for her healing. And she didn't get it on this earth. What? You'll start my car, something so insignificant that a set of jumper cables would have worked. But you didn't answer something that is important. And to begin with, June the 1st at 6.13 a.m. in Augusta, Georgia, my wife got her healing. She didn't come home to my earthly home. But she went home to be with her father. And she's healed. But sometimes when you're going through that, you don't see that. Because can I, can I be a little transparent with you? I left that morning. I was mad with God. I was mad. Hurt. Disappointed. Why God? I pulled off the side of the road, and we had a conversation that I will not repeat in church. You'll crank my stupid car, but you won't heal my wife. That we've served you. We served you with everything we had, gave you our life. But this stuff over here is insignificant. And everybody said, have you, I mean, maybe somebody's here today and they're in that same situation that you've been praying, but you don't feel like nothing's happening. Don't, you just don't feel like something's, nothing's happening right now. I've been praying. I've been believing, but God, where are you at? Come on, y'all. I, I, I mean, you may be here today. You're praying for a, a physical healing and you're not seeing it in your body right now. Can I tell you something? Keep praying. Maybe you're, you're praying for somebody's restoration. The more you pray, it seems like the worse they get. Maybe here today you're praying for a job, a better job, a better paying job. But it doesn't seem to come. Maybe you're here to, praying for conception of a child. I would say something real funny there, but I'm going to refrain. Let me give you number one point today. True prayer isn't about getting our way, but surrendering our will to God. True prayer. Somebody say true prayer. True prayer isn't about getting our way, but it's surrendering our will to God. Listen to this now. Remember Jesus when he knelt down in the Garden of Gethsemane? Being deity, knowing in foresight of what he was fixing to go through. The torment and the torture and the pain and the anguish and the, and the ridicules and, the, and all that he was going to go through. He knew that was coming his way. And he knelt down, the Bible says, that in such agony that he, he sweat as great drops of blood. Knowing what was to come. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. See, he was praying to his father, and he hadn't seen nothing happening, but he knew what was coming, but yet he had to surrender his will to God. Some of us right now, see, we live in a Western society. Me, 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 quick, fast. We live in a society of a microwave society. We stand in front of a microwave, and we tap our feet, 
waiting on something to hurry up and get out of the microwave. And in fact, my friend, we don't serve a microwave God. We serve a crock pot God. And when he gets done, it tastes better. It's going to be better for you. Y'all ain't with me today. It's going to be better for you. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. God does not sometimes in our lives make sense. And everybody said, amen. amen. I, I remember I'll talk about Pam being she's out today. <clears throat> you, you, you hang out, you, uh, I'll talk about you. But there was a day that she got the news that no parent would ever want to hear. Her daughter went in for a, a simple procedure the next thing she gets is the doctor coming out saying everything right now is going to be okay uh, she coded on us immediately as a parent she took charge of that with, went to the throne I rebuked death over my daughter they said she died three times. Heart stopped beating. She's fine and well right now. Living. Okay. But it don't make sense. You pray in it and you see it happen. But then again, on the other hand, you pray and you don't see it happen. I've watched God heal her body and, and so many things in her family. And, and I've watched, if I need somebody to pray for them, that's who I call. Because I, I've watched through the years that she's prayed for folks and healing just takes place. And, but yet again, what you don't understand is she deals with COPD every day. Every day. And you know that you know that you know that you know that you know. You heal this, but you won't heal this. Y'all with me today? Let's talk about somebody. If, we, if I had to say there was one person that ever walked the face of the earth besides Jesus that deserved their prayers to be answered, I would have to say the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, for those that don't know his story, he hated Christians. If the Apostle Paul was here today, he would hate me more than anybody in this room. Because he hated and persecuted Christians and put them to death. As you all know, he had that Damascus Road experience. And, and God spoke and opened his eyes up and, and, and showed him who Christ was in him. And he gave his life. To serving Christ. Amen. So now over his ministry. He traveled. For 20 years he traveled. He carried the gospel. Into Europe. And in that time. He wrote two thirds of the New Testament. In prison. He was shipwrecked. Five different times he was beaten with rods. 39 stripes on his back. Five times. About the time the scars would heal up, they'd beat him again. 39 times because, see, in those days, if they beat him 30 times, 31 times, 36 times, 39 times, and they die, oh, well, so be it. But the 40th time, if you hit them that 40th time, and they die, it's murder. See, it's no coincidence that our Savior took 39 stripes upon his back. Amen? <clears throat> he was snake beaten, bitten. Then he was stoned for the gospel. I, I think I ought to interject here. I ain't talking about... With herb. Oh, I can do this. <laughs> but he was stoned and left for dead for the gospel. So I would think that in that case, if whatever he asked, man, God would grant it. 
Amen? This is what he says in Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verse 7. In 2 Corinthians. 12, 7 says this. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. A thorn in my flesh. I mean, man, they, they, we've been around and around and around and around and around with what the thorn that Paul had in his flesh. Amen? I mean, I've heard that he had epilepsy. Lost his eyesight. Uh, so many different things. Migraine headaches. Uh, be honest with you, does it really matter? Some of us in this place right now have a thorn in our flesh. You may be sitting beside them. Don't poke. Don't prod. Don't look. Don't point. Okay. But some of us have a thorn in our flesh that no matter what we try or to do, it doesn't get any better. Doesn't get any better. So people deal with arthritis. And they pray and it doesn't get any better. So people deal, have to deal with diabetes. They pray and it doesn't get any better. Y'all with me today? So people have to deal with depression. They pray and it doesn't get any better. Y'all with me? I don't know what your thorn in the flesh is. Maybe, maybe it's some addiction that you have. Maybe there's some things in life that that's just overtakes you. You're doing good in all these areas, but this one area seems to hold you captive. I, I feel this today, y'all. Maybe there's a thorn in the flesh that starts in our mind. Y'all with me today? So what are you trying to say, Pastor? We just, we just give up and we don't pray? Let me tell you something. As long as the earth remains, God says that he's still God all by himself. Our job is to do what he says. In James 5, he says, if any sick among you, let them call upon the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. Our job is to do our part and let God weed out the rest. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's our job. Our job is to stand on the Word of God, the true written Word of God. As long as I'm pastor of this church, we will pray for folks. We will believe, and we will stand and trust God at His Word. No matter our circumstances, no matter what it looks like, God is God all by Himself. Somebody ought to, you ought to get excited with me because I'm telling you something. There's a God in heaven that loves you, but watch, watch. Sometimes we think he's late. Some of us say that sometimes he's uncooperative. Sometimes we think our prayers are not getting through the ceiling. Can I tell you something? He's a right on time God every time. He is a good God that is in heaven, not with a baseball bat, wanting to beat his children up. He is a God in heaven that will grant the wishes of his people. But let me tell you something. You're first going to learn to trust him, and you're going to have to allow him to be God of your life. I love what Paul said here. Be, I love what he said here. What did he say? Therefore, in order to keep me from being... Becoming conceited, God allowed something. Because in the troubles of your life, you will learn to trust God like you've never trusted him before. In the trials of your life, you'll learn to lean on God more than you've ever leaned on him before. When you ain't got somebody else to sustain you, God will carry you. You'll learn to reach out for him instead of reaching out for the world. Sometimes things are going on because he wants to work in you. Somebody say, change is happening. Change, change is happening. It's inevitable. You don't believe me? I used to be 20. <laughs> change happens. And it's out of your control, baby. Amen. 
You like the way you look? Take plenty of pictures. I, I think that's why we got a selfie society. Everybody, ooh, look good right now. Better about take pictures of that, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah, y'all. Come on. <laughs> ooh. Then all of a sudden, it's uh, anyway. You wake up one morning, you got somebody else's chin and yours, and <clears throat> you got stuff that you never had before. One thing about getting old, you start getting it adds to you. It doesn't. <laughs> Prayer. What is prayer? What is prayer? What is prayer? That, that's a key thing we need to know today. What is prayer? Prayer reminds us that we're not in control and keeps us close to the one who is. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, God's in control. God is in control. God's got this. Look at your neighbor and say, God's got this. God has got this right here. Don't you miss, think for a moment that God doesn't have it. God's got it. He's waiting on you. Maybe he needs to fix something in you so he can give it to you. Amen? Prayer reminds us that we're not in control and keeps us close to the one who is. Now, in verse 8, Paul says this. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. Three different times. See, that's not him just, well, I prayed three times a day and, and asked God to take this away from me. No, on three separate occasions, he sanctified and set apart prayer, fasting, and all, and prayed and begged God to take this thorn from him, whatever this thorn may have been. Some of you in here, I'm sure there's been times in your life, I know I have, I've gotten to a place I've had, I have begged God, although that is not correct. You should never have to beg God. You have not because you ask not. It's not that you have not because you beg not. God don't want you to beg. God wants you to ask. But when you ask, stand in faith. Faith that he's got this. It may not look good this second, but hang on. But hang on. If you'll just hang on a minute and don't let your, your circumstances overwhelm you, there's change coming. There's change. I promise you, there's change coming. And sometimes you might not like to change. Y'all with me today? But three significant seasons of prayer, he prayed. And if anybody deserved for God to answer him, Paul should have been answered. Paul, of all people that I can find in the Bible, I would say he deserved to be answered first and foremost above everybody else. But he didn't, he didn't get that. This is what he told him. In verse 19, or verse 9. But God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. We cry out, heal me. Change me. Change my circumstances. Fix my problems. Bless me, Lord. Give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. Amen? And this is what God's reply is. No, baby, my grace is sufficient. Grace. What is grace? I'm glad you asked. Grace is unmerited favor, something we didn't deserve, something we didn't work for, something we can't work for. It's not anything that we can do on our goodness or anything we can manufacture. It's God's goodness. Amen? In the, in the Greek text there, that word means charisi. It's undeserved favor, grace, or God freely extends himself, leaning and reaching to us because he is disposed to be blessed and be near us. In other words, I'm here. 155 times in the New Testament, he talks about grace. Amen? Amen. This is what I say. I always, when I pray to God, this is what I need. This is God's reply. No, I'm what you need. No, God, this is what I need. He says, no, this is what, I'm what you need. We have a society that 
needs to come to the understanding they need God. Sometimes you can't explain some things. All you can do is experience it. Sometimes you just can't explain things. You have to experience it. Remember, prayer, prayer shows us we're not in control. Amen? What prayer does is causes us to surrender our will to God. Prayer teaches us to surrender our will to God. Ooh. Third thing, prayer isn't just asking, but it's trusting. Prayer isn't just asking, but trusting. In other words, it's not just asking for what you want. It's trusting that God knows the best for you. Amen? And here we find Paul, he's looking back on the, after the fact, after the fact, he's looking back on the thorn in his flesh. How many times have you, have you, have you gotten uh, a decade, you look back a decade ago when you was going through something at that time and it didn't make sense to you and you, and you would question why is this going on in my life and Ten years later, you look back and you go, wow, I'm so grateful he didn't answer my prayer the way I wanted him to. Because if he had, this wouldn't have took place. If it had, I wouldn't be here. If he had, that might have destroyed me. If he had, y'all with me? I think we all, sometime or another in our life, can say that. In verse 9 and 10, Paul says this, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. That doesn't make sense. That does not compute in our Western mindset. Our, we cannot fathom that in our little finite minds of what he's trying to say here. He says, even though I may be weak, that's when I'm strong. Even though I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Even though I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Sometimes right now, I feel like I got to say this today to somebody. Even though you feel the weakest of your life right now, you're the strongest of your life. Why? Because now you'll submit your will to God and allow him to do a work in your life. You'll trust him. You'll trust him over your circumstances. You will trust him more than what you see. You'll trust him in more than what you hear. But y'all ain't with me today. Right now, we'll trust him. When we get in that weak moment, we realize now it's not in our strength, it's in his strength that he'll carry us. Amen? Sometimes we have to get in that place of weakness before we can get strong. Sometimes we've got to get in that place of weakness. Have you ever been to a place in your life you just at the end of your rope? Amen. Come on, I mean, can I, do I got any honest people in here in church with me today? Have you ever just been at that place you just felt like you was at the end of your rope? One more thing and it's over. I'm done. I've done. I've tried everything I know to do. I, I just can't do it no more. God, why? 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 Remember our Savior knelt down in that garden of Gethsemane, and he said, I am done. I'm at the end of my rope. I can't handle it no more. I know what's to come. I'm already getting persecution. These lazy disciples you gave me, they can't even pray. They over here won't even help me. I'm serving you, and God, I feel like I'm all alone, all by myself on a desolate island. God says, watch. Wrap it up and tie a knot at the end of it with your faith and let me carry you through this storm because I'm above every trouble and tra- turmoil that you have going on in your life. Amen. Tie a knot of faith in the end of it and hang on, baby, because I'm going to pull you up out of here. 
I'm going to pull you up out of here. I'm just tying not a faith in the end of that rope. Because I got you. Because when you get weak, you'll become strong. Because I, I, I say this all the time, and, and I pray this will resonate with your spirit today. Either you're going to do it or God's going to do it, but you're not both going to do it. When you can think you can do it in your own strength, you don't need God to help you do it. And that's what Paul is saying. He says, I thank God for the thorn in my flesh that's kept me humble, that's kept me sane, that's kept me peace, because I know I'm weak. Without him. I need him. I need him more than I ever needed him before. And the church said. Amen. Amen. For when I'm weak. For when I'm weak. I am made strong. For when I'm weak. See some people today sitting here right now. That are stressing over Christmas. Can I tell you something? It's coming, and it's going to go. It's going to come, and it's going to go. I said it's going to come, and it's going to go. It's going to come, and it's going to be all right. And it's going to go. It's going to come, and it's going to be all right. And it's going to go. It's sad that we have turned things to where Christmas is, a lot of people just, just despise Christmas season coming upon them because we've taken the joy of Christmas out. We've, we've commercialized it to the point is about what can I get when Jesus did not give us that example when he came to this earth. He didn't say, what can I get? He said, what can I give? He said, I didn't come to be served. I come to serve. I, what can I do for all mankind? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, he became weak so he could become strong. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And that's what Paul is saying. He said, I've become weak. To become strong. In other words, my physical strength couldn't do it anymore. I, if I had to guess what he had, because it doesn't tell us in the Bible, he probably had kidney stones. Anybody ever had kidney stones? <laughs> Amen? I mean, it is a thorn in the side. I don't know, and I say that not to be funny, but if you've ever experienced that, you'll understand what this statement I'm fixing to make. You can be going along there, and it will knock you to your knees. Five minutes later, you're up like nothing ever happened. Ten minutes later, you knock you to your knees. Five minutes later, you're like nothing ever happened. You can go three months, and nothing ever happened. Boom, it'll knock you to your knees. That's the way life is. That's the way life is. I don't understand anybody that wouldn't want their Savior to create them to be strong. Because I can promise you something. When that pain hits, you become weak. I don't care how big you are, how bad you are, how many bullets you can eat, and how many people you can beat up. I promise you, when that pain hits you, you will become weak. There's some things in our life are meant to make us weak so that we can become strong in him. So we will submit our will to him. And we can trust him more. Somebody say trust him. Not the plan. Trust him. Amen. Let me pray with you this morning. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word, that your word, let every man be a liar, but let your word ring true. Sometimes in this world that we live in, 
Life does not make sense. Sometimes we're praying and and we don't feel that you make sense to us. As Paul said, we become weak so that you can make us strong. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the each and every person that's here today to hear these words. That as the Holy Spirit moves through this place today, I ask that every heart be receptive to your presence here today. We thank you. Now, Father, we're not here asking. We're here surrendering today. And we just receive by faith your strength to overtake us in Jesus' name.